Shalom, let's follow Jesus along the Talmudim way. Acts chapter 3, we're calling this one Miracle in the Temple. Really, Acts 3 through 7 um, guide us through the explosive growth of the early church in Jerusalem. And we're going to see primarily in the next chapter that along with growth comes opposition. The establishment become alarmed at the growing popularity, and they, in their mind, that threatens to upset the status quo. Acts 3 and 4 probably should be studied together as the events in chapter 4 happen as a direct result of the miracle in chapter 3. But on our schedule, we'll uh, look at lesson 3, or Acts 3 this week, and Acts chapter 4 next time. Father, we ask you to bless our study and have us be like the Bereans who receive the word with all eagerness, but they examine the scriptures daily to see whether these things be so. By the study, enable each of us to be doers of your word and not hearers only. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Acts 3, verse 1. Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the ninth hour, the hour of prayer. Dr. Bolin writes, the language of going up to the temple in Jerusalem was quite normal since the, uh, uh, the temple sat on a hill and all approaches to it required going up, literally. Uh, those coming from the center would have to climb up from the south. Uh, those coming from the west had to go up the Central Valley and everyone else had to go uh, up down the Kidron Valley and then up, up back up into the temple. Notice that we can't glibly say Jesus did away with Judaism or the resurrection made the temple services obsolete. Uh, these types of statements are, are common today, but I think they're overly simplistic. Number one, because they would have been news to the apostles. Uh, notice here they're going up to the temple. The nature of these services definitely changed after the resurrection, and all sacrifices ceased with the destruction of the temple in AD 70, but um, they will once again resume in the Messianic age. But the disciples know that Jesus loved the temple, and he called it my father's house. When he was there, when he was at, when he was 12 years old, he thought the temple was, you know, a better place to be than with his parents. So uh, the d early disciples are definitely respecting that tradition, and they honor the temple and its and its services. The ninth hour is three in the afternoon. Um, this was uh, correlates to the time of the second offering. There was an offering in the morning at the third hour, nine in the morning, and there was an offering at the ninth hour, three in the afternoon. The Torah commands these morning and, and afternoon offerings, and we can read that in Numbers 28, and the apostles clearly kept those observances. And even to this day, in the absence of a temple, Jews will offer prayers to God at these times in the morning and afternoon. And so, uh, you know, say what you want, but they've got set prayer times where they uh, they focus twice a day. I don't know, I don't know how many of us uh, have, have set prayer times or do we just send up an emergency distress signal whenever we get into trouble. So something to think about there. That, that the disciples were at the temple does speak to the fact that uh, reminds us that the church started out as a holy Jewish sect. And even as a result of their presence in the temple, well, we're going to read in Acts 6, the word of God kept spreading. The number of disciples continued to increase greatly, and a great many of the priests were becoming obedient to the faith. So by the fact that they were in the temple, they were witnessing and causing non-believers to come to Jesus. And a man who had been unable to walk since birth was being carried, whom they used to set down every day at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, in order for him to beg for charitable gifts from those entering to the temple grounds. When he saw Peter and John about to go to the temple grounds, he began asking to receive a charitable gift. Firstly, there's a possible pun happening here. The prayers are called the Amidah, and that means standing because the people always stood as they prayed, just as they do today. If you see pictures of the Western Wall, most everyone is standing. So this man was unable to stand for the standing prayer. So we've got that going on here. There's uh, several different candidates for which gate this was. We don't know. We aren't sure the one that was called Beautiful. Having been there myself, and considering that the man was unable to walk, the southern steps, which you can see in the picture, uh, with which at one point had a double uh, gate, uh, that led up into the temple would have made more sense. It was a high traffic area, so very people going in and out, good place for begging if that was your thing. Um, the other suggested gates are either on top of the Temple Mount, 
Uh, and those would have presented logistical challenges of the man had to be carried up many steps where here he could just have been you know, dropped off and uh, maybe only carried a couple. It does seem unlikely that the priesthood would have allowed a beggar to position himself so close to the temple too. The other possible location is the Eastern Gate, but that was very uh, ceremonial only and not very well trafficked. So the, the Southern Steps with the, the double gate is, just seems to be the best in my mind. But uh, of course, who knows? You know, Maybe we'll find out someday. Um, today, it's, there's been a lot of growth and, and uh, construction in the area. So you've got uh, Islamic buildings and you've got crusader buildings and so the gates are walled up today you can't see them you can see the outline of them and the part that you can see in touch today is marked on the photo and then on the photo on the right is the same location as envisioned by the model of the first century uh, jerusalem that's at the israel museum but peter along with john looked at him intently and said look at us and he gave them his attention expecting to receive something from them but Peter said, I do not have silver and gold, but what I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, walk. Here's a statue of Peter in Rome. Whenever I get to this passage, I, I always remember something John Corson said uh, when he was teaching on this verse. He says that in America, and he has a very distinctive deep voice, we can no longer say silver and gold have I none, but we also can't say in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, walk. And boy, that is just a big conviction on our day and, and should give us pause. And grasping him, grasping him by the right hand, he raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were strengthened. And le leaping up, he stood and began to walk. He entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God, and they recognized him as being the very one who used to sit at the beautiful gate of the temple to beg for charitable gifts. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. According to Dr. Bolin, uh, it's likely that when they went to the temple, the man would have been leaping somewhere in view of this photo. That's kind of neat to think about. The apostles were truly commissioned by Jesus, and now they were going out in his authority as his ambassadors. John 14, verse 12 is a good one to commit to memory. Truly, truly, I say to you, the one who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these he will do, because I am going to the Father. So the healed man now accompanies Peter and John to the inner courts, and he was able to stand for the standing prayers. And not unlike the Gospel of John, a miracle gives way to a discourse. So John has seven uh, miracles and then seven discourses around those miracles. We're going to see that same thing here. There are a number of points to compare and contrast with Peter's speech in Acts 2 uh, versus the one we're about to read. Essentially, Peter is, in, in a sense, he's going to pick up where he left off and continue to develop his argument. The speech at Pentecost put more focus on Jesus' resurrection, but this speech is going to recall the details of his trial. Acts 2 focused on God's promise to David. This one here in Acts 3 is going to emphasize God's promise to Abraham. In Acts 2, he drew frequently from the Psalms, but here he's going to draw primarily from Isaiah, but he will also reference um, other books in the Torah. Let's go ahead and read. While he was clinging to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them at the portico named Solomon's, completely astonished. But when Peter saw this, he replied to the people, Men of Israel, why are you amazed at this? And why are you staring at us as though by our own power or godliness we made him walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus, the one whom you handed over and disowned in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. So we believe Solomon's colonnade was at a location along the eastern wall uh, along the Temple Mount, and it overlooked the, the Mount of Olives. We'll get back to this in, uh, in Acts chapter 5, because they're going to be back at the same place. And possibly the disciples gathered here because this is where Jesus gathered, uh, such as his, uh, when he observed Hanukkah in John chapter 10. At the time of the Feast of Dedication, at, at that time, the Feast of Dedication took place in Jerusalem, and it was winter. That can only be Hanukkah. Jesus was walking in the temple area in the portico of Solomon, and, and then John goes on. So because of that, this is the hangout of the apostles. And after being sprung from prison in Acts 5, they're going to be right back here uh, again teaching and preaching. This reference to Pilate is curious. This, uh, what you see on your screen is a limestone inscription that was found in 1961 
at uh, the theater in Caesarea. And this stone is the only archaeological evidence that we found that has Pilate's name on it. And before it was discovered, scholars and skeptics actually denied Pilate's existence and thus denied the accuracy of the Bible. It's really fascinating that in our age, God is really using archaeology to reveal things to us and, and support. The archaeology doesn't tell us anything new, but it supports the Bible in ways that previous generations never dreamed of. And that's just really, really exciting. There's a curious thing that as we go through Acts, Romans are going to be typically good guys. If he does criticize a Roman, Luke often softens the response. But here, you know, we, we know Jesus was mistreated under Pilate, but in Luke's reckoning, he's spinning that just a little bit. Pilate had decided to release him, but the people demanded uh, Barabbas instead of Jesus. But you disown the holy and righteous one and ask for a murderer, that's Barabbas, to be granted to you. But put to death the prince of life, whom God raised from the dead, a fact to which we are witnesses. And on the basis of faith in his name, it is the name of Jesus which has strengthened this man whom you see and know. And the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect health in the presence of you all. So Peter's saying, not us. It, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's all God. And now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance. This is a strong, astonishing statement, uh, just as your rulers also did. But in the things which God has previously announced by the mouth of the prophets, that his Messiah, his Christ, would suffer, he has fulfilled in this way. So for the better part of the last 2,000 years, the church has persecuted the Jews as Christ killers, despite not once but twice the Bible says that they acted in ignorance. Luke 23, verse 24, Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And then also here, I know, Peter saying, I know you acted in ignorance. Like Joseph, we just studied, Peter has 50-20 vision. Genesis 50-20, what you mean for evil, God can use for good. So even though the, the Bible pronounces them as acting in ignorance, uh, you know, we, we still hold it against them. And not, not us, hopefully, but, but the church and, and Christians have in general. Although many of us are loosely familiar with all the laws and the rituals in the Old Testament that are, are there to atone for sin, uh, did you know that such atonement is only available for sins committed in ignorance? So Peter's uh, pronouncement that they acted in ignorance is actually critical here because the Torah has no provision for sins committed intentionally. That should give us pause uh, as, as we love our lives trying to not be sinless, but we want to definitely want to sin less. Peter uses a number of titles for Messiah here. Um, many titles are repeated in different books throughout the Bible, but it's interesting that all titles appear in the book of Isaiah. So I kind of think that he's, he's drawing on Isaiah in contrast to uh, the Psalms, which we saw in Acts chapter 2. So when he says his servant, that would bring to mind Isaiah 53, generally the suffering servant passage, but specifically verse 13, Behold, my servant will prosper. He will be lifted up and greatly exalted. Holy One is another title of God in the Psalms and Isaiah. To whom then will you compare me that I would be his equal, says the Holy One, Isaiah 40, verse 25. Thus, to apply it to one born of a woman is blasphemy unless Jesus is who he says he is. So to, to call Jesus the Holy One, uh, ha he has to be God or, or Jesus has to be crazy. Uh, or, or, you know, his disciples have to be crazy. And of course, we know he's God. There's no option in, in this gospel for Jesus is just a good teacher. Uh, I'm a fan. You can't be a fan. He's either the Holy One of Israel or, you know, again, his, his, the apostles were deluded. Righteous one is a title for both God, where Isaiah 24, 16 says, Glory to the righteous one, and God's Messiah. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many, for he will bear their wrongdoings. That's another verse from the suffering servant passage, Isaiah 53. Jewish interpretation did not consistently equate Messiah with deity, so this might have been kind of new thinking, but Peter could be saying that they should have. Uh, we have to be Bereans, and we have to guard against this, this making the same types of mistakes out of ignorance that the people that day made. You see a statue of the Ten Commandments. The Fifth Commandment is, you shall not murder. And, of course, the religious leaders showed a complete disregard for this commandment through their actions. Prince or Prince of Life comes from Isaiah 9, 6. It's a verse we may recall at Christmas time. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and then the Prince of Peace. You can see a picture of Jesus', uh, the traditional location of Jesus' tomb at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. 
Uh, witnesses and witness is, is going to be a big theme in Acts because witnesses are required by the Torah to testify when called to do so. And the apostles are going to call on this and make reference to this when they're on trial in Acts chapter 5. Messiah in Hebrew, Christ or Christos in Greek, anointed in English, all, all meaning Messiah or anointed one. Isaiah 61, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord anointed me to bring good news to the humble. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim the release of the captives and freedom to the prisoners. And this, of course, if you've seen the scene in The Chosen, um, this is when Jesus is at the synagogue in Nazareth and he is quoting Isaiah 61. He's basically saying, this day is here. I am the Messiah. And of course, uh, they know exactly what he's saying and they react accordingly by trying to throw him off the cliff. Peter concludes, therefore, repent and return so that your sins may be wiped away in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord and that he may send Jesus the Christ, the Messiah appointed for you, whom heaven must receive until the period of restoration of all things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from ancient times. What Peter is promising here is the full establishment of of the Messianic Kingdom and the, the benefits that come along with that. And remember Dr. Mark Nanos's theory that the resurrection ushered in the, the inauguration of the kingdom. And that is going to be, according to him, is, is what motivates Paul to be the apostle to the Gentiles. So it's not completed yet, and Peter's saying there's going to be a time where uh, the Messiah has, has to step away and, and get things in order, and you know, he, he goes to prepare a place, but then uh, one day it will be fulfilled. Many dozens of passages in the prophets speak about the time where, uh, when Messiah will establish God's kingdom on earth and then return creation back to its intended goal. Remember, the, we, we weren't designed to sin. We were designed perfect. It was our choice to sin. This passage is from Isaiah 11, and it, it contains a combination of so many of these important ideas that the apostles would have cherished. And again, I think uh, it's uh, one of... Peter's themes in this speech is to uh, really draw on the book of Isaiah. So we'll read a little bit of uh, Isaiah 11. Then a shoot will spring up from the stem of Jesse, and a branch from his roots will bear fruit. The Spirit of the Lord will rest upon him. Righteousness will be the belt around his hips, and faithfulness the belt around his waist. And the wolf will dwell with the lamb, and the leopard will lie down with the young goat. The calf and the young lion and the fattened steer will be together. A little boy will lead them. And on that day, the nations will resort to the root of Jesse. The nations, Gentiles, resort to the root of Jesse, who will stand as a signal flag for the peoples, and his resting place will be glorious. So just a hint of the Messianic kingdom is uh, basically he's offering that to them if only they would repent. Moses said, The Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your countrymen. To him you shall listen regarding everything he says to you. And it shall be that every soul that does not listen to that prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. In verse 22, he's directly quoting Deut Deuteronomy 18, verse 18. In verse 23, he appears to be blending Deuteronomy 18, 19. And it shall come about that whoever does not listen to my words, uh, who, which he speaks in my name, blending that with Leviticus 23, 29, anyone who does not observe the day of atonement shall be cut off from his people. So he's kind of blending those two together. At a minimum, this prophet uh, would have the same authority as Moses. Every prophet after Moses, God had to speak through revelations, dreams, and signs. But with Moses, God spoke directly. And of course, Jesus, you know, is the very words. He speaks the very words of God. The people as a whole failed to heed Moses' words and warnings, just as they were failing to heed Jesus' words. So Peter is pointing this out to them, and he urges them to repent. And likewise, all the prophets who have spoken from Samuel and his successors onward have also announced these days. Basically, everyone's pointing to this Messianic era with the Messiah. It is you who are the sons of the prophets and the covenant which God ordained with your father, saying to Abraham, and in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. God raised up his servant for you first and sent him to bless you by turning everyone from your wicked ways. So a, a bit of denouncement earlier now gives way to a plead and an offer to uh, accept the Messiah. In his speeches, uh, Peter typically states that the hearers have an opportunity to repent and be blessed. 
And this includes those who were directly involved in Jesus' mistreatment. So Peter holds no ill will, he, and he will write later, God is not willing, in, him, in, in Peter in his epistles, God is not willing that any should perish, but all come to repentance. This is a, a picture of Samuel's hometown, uh, Ramah, which we can read about in 1 Samuel 7. Um, the Talmud says frequently that all the, prophet, all the prophets prophesied only for the days of Messiah. So everyone was looking forward to, to the days of Messiah. All, your fam- all the families of the earth will be blessed, of course, comes from Genesis 12, 3. Peter is saying that Messiah is that seed of Abraham, and Paul will say exactly the same thing in Galatians 3, 16. Peter himself likely at this time didn't realize the full implications of what he's saying here. The blessing of Abraham's seed are going to be on, upon the whole families of the earth, right? The meaning the Gentiles. And Peter had to come to grips with that. That took a, that was a bit of a mindset change. Uh, Dr. Bolin writes uh, of the picture you see here, set in the old Jewish quarter of Berea, this unused synagogue is one of the oldest synagogues in northern Greece that is still standing. There has been a Jewish presence in northern Greece almost continually since the third century. Berea, of course, why would I pick this picture? Berea, of course, is home to the Bereans who receive the word with great eagerness, but search the scriptures daily. And I hope you're enjoying being a Berean as we dig into God's word. And so with that, we'll break here and we'll see you next time for Acts chapter 4.